Um, my name is Megan Wee, and I want to uh, welcome everybody on behalf of Smart Practice and Practice Mojo uh, to the webinar. Smart Practice and Practice Mojo's combined focus is on making life easier for dental practices like yours. Sorry if you're hearing the buzzer on that timer. Um, in particular, Smart Practice has been around for over 40 years, and over those 40 years, they have perfected recall and marketing primarily through um, recall postcards because offices and patients want to transition to electronic reminders like emails, text messages, or phone calls. They have partnered with Practice Mojo as their preferred automated communication service. And we believe it's the most comprehensive service because um, their customer service and commitment to helping offices is right on par with smart practices. So if you're not currently using a service or looking to switch to a new one after this webinar, um, I encourage you to schedule a demo so we can go over how uh, Practice Mojo can help implement some of these changes we're going to talk about today. As a product coordinate, coordinator for Practice Mojo, I've personally worked with hundreds of offices from all over the country and helping them implement a change by automating their patient communication. So I know firsthand how busy offices are and the importance of making any implementation as easy as possible. I've personally trained them on recare strategy, timing of automated communications, internal marketing, online presence, and really consider myself an extension of Practice Mojo's team as we help them through each step in that process. Um, not one of our customers has regretted implementing the change um, that they identified as being needed through using Practice Mojo. Um, through each of those conversations, though, while training some of our offices, I ask about their goals and then provide as many tools as I can to help them achieve those. Um, but in some cases, I've become aware that having a goal comes easy, it's just implementing and tracking the goal, the goal that becomes the difficult part. So we are really, really excited to uh, introduce you to Jennifer Schultz, and she will be discussing exactly how to implement change and meet your goals in the dental office. Jennifer, if you can go back to that slide before, I just wanna show some of our attendees some of the tools that they're gonna be able to use um, throughout the webinar. If you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, there is an audio setting tab. Um, this audio setting should be muted for all attendees, but I think, I believe you have control over volume of what you're hearing, so you can play with that a little bit. Um, there's also a question and answer, a Q&A tab, which I would love for you to use for any questions you're going to have throughout the webinar. That's a really easy tool for us to be able to track all the questions you have and make sure that we're answering them and not skipping over them. There's also a chat tab, which is enabled if you have any comments or anything to make. But again, uh, please use the Q&A tab for questions so we make sure we don't lose track of those. And then there's also a raise hand feature. Um, if we're asking maybe some yes or no questions, we might ask you to raise your hand. So for example, in practicing that, uh, raise your hand if you are ready for Jennifer to get started. Um, we've got a lot of people raising their hand. Thanks for paying attention. Perfect. So I'm going to hand this over to Jennifer and let her talk about implementing change. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. All right. So today we're going to talk about the path to implementing change in a dental practice. Um, just real quick, just to give you a, a little bit of an introduction of who I am. Um, I'm Jennifer Schultz. I've worked in dentistry for over 20 years, uh, both as a hygienist, a software trainer, a consultant. Um, I founded Virtual Dental Office. Uh, we provide VAs for administrative team members at the front desk and dental insurance navigator, and also am the creator of the Achievement Blueprint. A couple years ago, I was walking into a practice for the first time. I had spoken with a doctor on the phone and walked in to introduce myself to the woman at the front desk. Her name was Diane. And Diane shook my hand and then sat back in her chair and crossed her arms. And she said to me, Jennifer, you're not the first consultant to have come in here. And I just wanna let you know that regardless of what you do, he is never going to change. We've spent countless hours in team meetings talking about things to implement in our practice, and it always goes back to the way that it was. 
And I could see that Diane was very frustrated. She was frustrated with the time that she had spent in team meetings in, uh, in trying to improve the practice. She personally wanted to achieve the goals that they had discussed, but had felt a lot of frustration when indeed things had kind of gone back to the way that they were before. And that got me on a journey to find out what makes some practices implement change very quickly and see results quickly and why other practices do not. I believe that the failure to implement change in a dental practice is indeed the biggest area of untapped potential that we are not speaking about. If you think about all of the time that doctors spend on CE, consulting, time spent in team meetings, on technology, when that change or initiative is not implemented, it essentially makes the investment in those services uh, ineffective. And what I have found over the years in observing my clients, uh, I, my consulting clients were all within a, just a couple hours drive of my home in Iowa. And so I saw a lot of similar practices, similar numbers of doctors, similar areas. And there was a big difference between the practices as far as how quickly they saw results or even if they saw results. And I knew that while every practice is unique and we spoke to that at our workshops that the information that I was delivering was very similar. And so I really looked into what, what makes the difference and how can we increase that speed of implementation for every practice. So I found that there are six key elements that are present in practices that implement change and see results. And I know that if you integrate these six key elements, that you too will uh, find yourself successful with implementing change in your practice. Now, before we jump into each of these six key elements, I'd like you to just take a moment and think about the initiatives in your practice that you have uh, you've implemented or attempted to implement or implemented for a while, but then they came to a halt. And I'd like you to identify one that you can keep in mind throughout the webinar. And as we're going through these six key elements, what I'd like you to do is just jot down any elements that you feel are contributing to that initiative coming to a halt or not progressing. All right, let's go ahead then and get started. So the first key element in ensuring successful implementation is who? Who is leading? Who is leading the practice? Every practice has a leader. Uh, the doctor is always the leader. The doctor that's writing the paycheck is always the leader, whether they want to be or not. However, they can delegate other aspects of their practice. They can delegate uh, initiatives to someone else in the practice to lead. It is important for team members to know who they should go to with questions or comments for the initiative. So it's important that the entire team understands who is leading this initiative. The other aspect of who is leading is are they leading by example? Uh, what, what comes to mind when I think of this is a parent and, and children, because children imitate so much what their parents do. And I think it might be easy for us to say, oh, well, I'm a grown adult, I'm not like a child. However, we just see it over and over again in organizations how uh, we do follow the leaders. And I know in having worked with hundreds of dental practices over the years, that if the doctor is not leading, someone else is, someone else is. And so it's very important that we do as I do, not do as I say as a leader. An example of how this plays out in a dental practice 
is, let's just say that the initiative is to increase new patients. And to do that, the doctor wants uh, to increase the number of online reviews so that they will show up higher on that Google search. And so the doctor and the team have decided that they are going, each team member is going to target two patients a day, um, their favorite patients, that they will inform them that they're going to be receiving an email asking for an online review. If the doctor is not asking those two patients a day or mentioning to those two patients a day that they'll be receiving this email um, from a service like Practice Mojo or another patient communication service that you're using, if the doctor's not speaking to those patients, then the team members, even if they were initially, slowly you'll see that they will stop doing that. Um, because really what the doctor is saying, although not verbally, is that this really isn't that important or this really is too hard for us to do. And so it's difficult to hold someone accountable when you're not doing it yourself. So the first one is who is leading and are they leading by example? And again, the doctor could delegate that to an office manager, um, but the same thing will hold true. An example of that would be if the initiative is to collect more money on day of service, and so the plan is to ask patients for payment on day of service. Maybe this is something that in this particular office they were not doing. And if the office manager is filling, or is helping out at the front desk and a patient comes to check out and the patient says something to the office manager like, do I owe anything today or can you just send that into insurance? And the office manager responds with, oh, we'll just send that into insurance. It will not be a long time before the rest of the team is not asking for payment on day of service as well. The second key element in implementing change is what? What is the goal and what is the plan to achieve it? It's very important that your entire team understand what the goal is. What do you want to accomplish? Uh, you've probably heard of SMART, the SMART acronym when you're creating your goals. Uh, one of the key points of SMART is that it needs to be specific and it needs to be measurable. And you might think, oh yes, you know, that, that's pretty easy to be specific and measurable, but I've found that actually quite often goals are not. Um, I, I saw that um, most of us, when we're creating our New Year's resolutions, we will make the same New Year's resolution. 10 times or more in our lifetime. And I think a perfect example of that is losing weight. How often does someone make a New Year's resolution to lose weight? But losing weight is not specific and it's not measurable. Now, losing five pounds by February is much better, but we also need to know where you're at now and where you'll be then. So when it comes to the dental practice, Here's an, an example of how I've seen this play out is we need more new patients. That's our goal, to get more new patients. However, to change that to be specific, we would need to know how many more new patients do we need. And to make it measurable, we certainly would want to know how many new patients are we currently receiving on average per month. So if today we know that we have 1,100 active patients, and we want to have 1,200 active patients in the next 90 days, now we have something to work with. Now we know that we need to increase the number of active patients by 100 patients in the next quarter or 90 days, which is approximately 33 patients a month. We also would want to be very specific about what an active patient is defined as. You know, maybe that they've come in for any reason in the last 24 months. So our goals really need to be specific 
when we're talking about the initiative so that everybody knows everybody's focused on the same thing everybody knows where where we're going the second part of what is what is the plan to achieve it how are you going to make it happen just announcing it is not enough um, actually it can be quite deflating so if the goal is to increase collections and and even if we said let's increase collections by ten thousand dollars a month if it is not discussed as a team how that's going to happen what the plan is to make that happen as you know that can be very deflating to the team because now it feels more like a carrot being waved in front of the team rather than okay here's the goal but here's how we're going to achieve it uh, i i was speaking with a client recently and uh, went in and and said to the client, okay, here are the areas of largest potential in your practice, and here are my recommendations for achieving that. And here's the training that we would want to cover with your team. And this doctor said, oh yeah, I think that's great. Just to let you know, I do not like team meetings. Now, I really think that team meetings are just a big complaining session. So let's do this but I don't want to do that with a team meeting. And I said, okay, doctor, uh, how do you recommend then that we discuss this plan with your team without setting aside time for a team meeting? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, okay, let's do team meetings. And I can tell you that we did lots of team meetings over the course of that year, and uh, they now still have team meetings. But in dentistry, how often are we really scheduling aside time for team meetings? And if we're not, how are we discussing the plan? How are you discussing the plan to achieve that goal? I happen to feel that team meetings are a great way to do this. It's a great opportunity to discuss how you're going to achieve that goal. You don't need necessarily to have the entire team present, depending on what the goal is. It is good, I think, to have the team present when possible. And the reason for that is then you're incorporating all positions of the practice at this team meeting, and they can give you their perspective. Obviously, someone who is working at the front desk and someone who's working chair side have different perspectives. They see the practice from different angles. The communication that they're having with patients is different as well. And so I think that that's very helpful at a team meeting to have all aspects. It also helps everyone make sure that they're all on the same page in regards to the initiative. So not necessary, but I believe very helpful and I do recommend having the entire team present. So in that same example, if we were going to add 33 patients a month to our active patient base, one of the things that we would want to take into consideration is simply attrition. How many patients a month are you losing just from patients moving away, change, changing insurance, uh, or not scheduling? Um, if you were losing, a, on average, eight patients a month, due to attrition, then we actually would need 41 new or reactivated patients to increase our active patient base by 33 a month. And if we knew that this practice averaged 25 new patients a month, then we now know that we would need to reactivate 16 patients a month. So that is the plan. So we talked first about what the goal is, which is to increase the active patient base by 190 days. And then now we're talking about, okay, let's break it down into what that actually looks like. Now from here, this is the statistics, but we would want to break it down even further and say, okay, well, um, how often are patients being contacted through our patient communication system uh, where they're receiving their emails and texts? Uh, you know, uh, that portion of it can happen automatically for us once we've already set it up. But then are we also making phone calls to patients? We don't certainly need to do that as often when using a system like Practice Mojo. 
However, if an active patient is a patient that's been in the practice for any reason within 24 months, and we know that they're gonna be receiving emails and texts automatically, do you still want to make phone calls? Maybe a practice says, yes, I still would like a patient to receive four phone calls before we inactivate them two years later. So maybe the month they're due, six months, 12 months, and 18 months, they receive a phone call. This all is the plan. And sometimes I think it can be easy to just stop short with, okay, well, we need to reactivate patients. But what I'm suggesting is that it needs to be down to the detail. And how often are we following up with these patients? How are we following up with them, et cetera? The other benefit of having a team meeting to discuss the plan is to say to the team, Okay, here's the plan. Here's our goal. Here's the plan. Now, what potential obstacles do you see with this plan? What, what possible challenges do you see? What are you concerned about? I love to do that at the team meeting because that opens up uh, a great discussion about other team members introducing things from their point of view, from their perspective in the practice that we might not have seen. And I'd much rather talk about that and work through it at a team meeting than on the fly. And so it's a really great opportunity just to discuss the plan and the goal. All right, so we have who is leading and are they leading by example? What is the goal and what is the plan? And now we have when. When is it going to happen? and by whom. When is an element that I have found is left out quite frequently, and it is actually a, a stopping point for many practices, something that does bring that initiative to a halt fairly quickly. When we're talking about something like reactivating hygiene patients and making those phone calls four times a year in the practice, often how that discussion goes is the doctor says, let's have we have Sally make those calls. Uh, maybe Sally's the hygienist. And the benefit of having Sally make those calls is she can talk about the patient's clinical reason that they need to come back in. For example, Sally could say, hey, Mary, I've noticed I haven't seen you in a while. I'm you know, concerned about that area on the upper left. Let's schedule an appointment to get you in. That's a great conversation that, a great phone call that can come from the hygienist. However, doctors often don't want to schedule time for that because hygienists have patients that cancel or fail, which is completely understandable, right? You wanna make use of that time. What I often see though, is that when that time is not scheduled, that days and months go by and the time to actually make those phone calls just doesn't happen. And it's not necessarily because of any sort of ill intention, but more just because team members are busy. They're very busy. And when they have an opening in the schedule, ideally they're helping other team members with patients or helping out in other areas in the office that, it, that are more immediate. So these kinds of projects often get thrown to the wayside, and yet we know that it is essential for a thriving business to make sure that their patients remain active. So by scheduling it on the calendar, that will ensure, help ensure that it is getting done. Here's what I recommend for scheduling some tasks like reactivating uh, hygiene patients so that your time is still spent the best way possible. If you know every month that you are going to follow up with patients that are due this month, six months overdue, 12 months overdue, and 18 months overdue, if you contact all of those patients every month and you run that list on the first day of the month, Let's just say that there's 60 patients on that list, okay? Because ideally patients are, are scheduling when they're in your practice. On the last day of the month, the last working day of the month, 
for you to contact 60 patients, it would take 90 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but if we just blocked out 90 minutes, then what you could do is throughout the month, as patients cancel, as team members have time, they can call the patients on this list. About a week before the last day of the month, you can take a look at how much time you have blocked and how many patients need to be called. Then if you need, if no patients have been called, you've just had a really busy month, then you'll certainly want to keep that block. Now what you could do is move the block to another team member if needed, if the hygiene time was more important. Maybe it's end of the year and you just have a long list of patients that are trying to get in. You could certainly move that block to an administrative team member. Or let's say that throughout the month, there has been more available time and you've gotten through all but five of the phone calls. Well, then a week before, you're gonna look at that block and say, well, I certainly don't need that time to make those appointments, let's remove that block. I could do five phone calls at the end of the day if I needed to. Blocking time works extremely well because in dentistry, we know that appointments are reserved time. We reserve that time for our patients and we take it very seriously. And so one of the key elements in implementing change is blocking time to make sure that you can complete what you need to do. And the key with blocking is just making sure that you have a time frame that you will pull that block if you don't need it. Now, making, you know, setting a block is not essential for every example of every initiative. If you're asking for payment on day of service, you're not going to block that in the schedule. However, maybe you block time to review how many patients paid that day for on day of service uh, or any administrative things that you'll need to do. The important thing is to think it through when you're planning out what needs to be done for the initiative and to block time when needed. Um, remember, you can always remove those blocks. Um, another example would be uh, online reviews. If you want to increase your online reviews, uh, maybe you need to block some admin time so that Mary can get trained on utilizing the new technology in the program and setting it up so that patients automatically get their email after every appointment. And then do we need to block time for Mary so that she can share the online reviews with the team, the new online reviews? And will Mary be sending a thank you note to patients that have posted an online review? So all, all things that without it being blocked, these, these initiatives can often just really get pushed by the wayside. But with that blocked time, you're ensuring that, that it'll happen. All right, so we have who, what, when, and where. Where are you going as a practice? This is referring to vision. And vision can, I think, often be one of these things that we talk about, we may or may not have a vision, may or may not know where the practice is going. Um, it's not something that I see that often in dentistry, but we see it much more in other industries. And so it is very important though for the team to know the vision of the practice. Your team cannot help you get there if they do not know where you're, go where you're going. Uh, is the doctor looking to grow the practice, maybe purchase additional practices, bring on another associate or hygienist? Maybe their vision is to simply decrease their write-offs and try and keep more of what they produce. A doctor might say that they need more new patients because in their mind, they want to decrease PPO involvement and they're looking to drop plans. So if they have more new patients, then they could drop some of these plans um, that they feel they're adjusting too much off for. Now, without knowing the vision, the team might interpret that to think that they simply need to join more plans to get more new patients. And so 
In many other industries, there are SOP manuals or standard operating procedure manuals, and it helps team members know the direction of the business. It also helps them to know how to respond to questions as they come up. In dentistry, most often we do not have those simply because of the time needed to create something like that. And so by having your entire team know your vision, uh, it can help them respond to situations when the doctor is not standing right there to give the response that they're looking for. I recently read a book called Creating Magic by Lee Cockerell, and he worked for Disney, and he was pretty high up there. And uh, if, if you're aware, Disney's vision is simply to make people happy. And he had a lot of great stories throughout this book just about customer service, but uh, one that I found interesting was about this little boy who was visiting the park, and he leaned over in the drinking fountain to get a drink of water and his tooth fell out um, and he was crying and that's why one of the disney team members was drawn over they saw this little boy crying at the drinking fountain and he was so upset because he had lost his tooth and the tooth fairy was not going to bring him any money so the team member said to the family you know why don't we're going to look for your tooth and why don't you meet us back here at the end of the day at, at 6 p.m and so the family went on and they were able to have fun and enjoy the rest of their day and they took apart the drinking fountain to try to find this tooth and they were not able to find it and so what they did is they created a plaster version of the little front tooth and when they met the family back there that evening, they handed it to the little boy and he didn't know. Now, I think about this story and a couple of things pop into mind. One is, wow, what amazing customer service to, to go that far out of your way to make this little boy happy. Uh, the other thing that pops out to me is Lee put this story in his book because he was so proud of his team for thinking outside the box and, and making this boy happy, really living out the vision of Disney. Now, if they had not known the vision of Disney or where Disney wanted to go or how important it was to Disney to make sure that people were happy, they may have handled this differently. As a matter of fact, one of the other things that popped into my head when I was reading the story, story was, wow, how much time and money was spent to recreate this tooth for this little boy? And yet they, the management at Disney was extremely happy. The family was extremely happy. And so just a great, I think, example of how important it is to know the vision of the company and where the company wants to go. Another company that you know is Southwest Airlines, and their vision is to become the world's most loved, most flown, and most profitable airline. And I've seen uh, Facebook posts from colleagues who are flying Southwest or little phone videos of the Southwest attendants uh, having fun with the emergency announcements. And uh, I just think that's great because team members at Southwest know that they are trying to change the experience of their passengers to make them think of fun and loving to fly when they think of Southwest. So when it comes to dentistry, where, where does the doctor wanna take the practice and is the team fully aware of their vision that will help them in implementing change because they know where they want to go beyond just the goal of increasing collections by $10,000 or adding more active patients. They know that the goal is actually to add enough active patients over the next year or two to bring on an associate. All right, the fifth key element in implementing change is why. Why is it important? When we think about goals and creating the plan, one of the things that I have found that is often overlooked is why. Not only why it's important to increase the number of active patients, but the level of importance to the owner or leader of the practice. And what I mean by that is 
what I have seen happen often is that we create all these initiatives, but then another initiative or another idea comes along and then we add that one as well. And if the initiative is not a level of eight or higher on a level on a scale of one to 10, it is something that I do not recommend that you bring to the team. So when at the beginning of the webinar, when I spoke with you about Diane and how Diane had said that they had spent all this time uh, creating plans to achieve goals and in the end, nothing ever changes. Really what she was saying is that the initiatives that were created were not that important to the leader of the practice. They weren't important enough to make him change. And so when we bring things to the team and they are not important enough to the leadership or the owners of the practice, and they're not going to follow through with it, then what we start to do is set a precedent that teams do not really need to pay attention to what we're spending our time on because in a couple weeks, it'll just go away. I have had that conversation with other team members when I was an employee. Sometimes there are meetings after the meeting. And ideally, that doesn't happen. Ideally, all that is coming out in the team meeting. But I can tell you that I remember very clearly when a colleague said to me, I can't believe that we're doing this, but it doesn't matter because in a couple weeks, that'll be the end of it. They'll forget all about it. And all that is, is, is simply bringing initiatives to the team before it's really important. Eight out of 10. Um, it also goes along with the Pareto principle, which simply means that 20% of what we do gives us 80% of our results. And so when we're bringing an initiative to the team, we need to make sure that it is very important to implement very important to the leaders that this is something that does not get dropped. All right, and the sixth key element to successful implementation is what's up. And what's up is referring to our communication and accountability. Communication in a dental practice is challenging at best. When we think about how a dental practice functions, ideally the hygienists have their own schedules and they're packed with patients and the doctor, doctors have their own schedules and they're packed with patients. And we have different team members responsible for different areas in the practice. And ideally we're all busy enough that we don't really much ha have time to communicate during the day, right? That's really what we're looking for. Um, and on top of that, we have team members that work on different days. Sometimes they come in at different times of the day. Some leave early, some leave late. And so communication by design in a dental practice is very challenging. If you are not having scheduled team meetings, that adds to the level of difficulty to communicate. If you hear in your practice, why am I always the last to know? then you know that communication is challenging in your practice as well. Now, instant messaging has its place. I love instant messaging. I think it is great. It is great though for some things. It is great for things like your patient's here or your patient's filling out paperwork or your patient's now ready to be seated. But what I'm referring to is ongoing communication about your initiatives. Email is an option, however, I have found email to be not a great option. Here are my challenges with email. You have a subject line, multiple people copied on the email, and over time, I'm, I begin searching for the information that I'm looking for in the email, and now I have 20 emails that I have to search for because it contains that phrase of word. Uh, and and so it can be very difficult. Also, the subject doesn't often reflect correctly what's in the body of the email. So what I have found works very well are your virtual conference rooms. 
where you can go, you can tag team members, you can have topics and subtopics, and so you literally just post in the area that it is um, that the conversation reflects. A perfect example of this would be if a practice says that they want to purchase computers, uh, and the doctor says to Sally at the front desk, he says, Sally, could you please get some estimates from our supply reps, maybe from our IT person, and from this computer store in town? And Sally says, great. And then Lisa says, oh, you know what? My cousin works at the computer store. I'll get, I'll get that estimate. Perfect. All right. So over time, uh, Lisa speaks with her cousin. He hands her something, and she puts it on doctor's desk. And then Sally speaks to the uh, sales reps. One rep faxes something over, one rep emails it. So the fax goes on doctor's desk, just on top of the pile, and the email gets forwarded to the doctor. Before long, you can see that we have multiple team members with multiple ways to communicate all um, in different areas. Some are on the desk, some are via email. So these virtual conference rooms work great for communicating. Uh, and and you can tag team members and you can upload files as well so then how that would be different is doctor would go to the virtual conference room and under the topic computers would have the comments from the team members with the estimates also in these areas you can delete messages which is really important so that when other people say got it uh, you can delete that so that you're only left with the meat that you want to reference and then the second key, uh, the second portion of the what's up is accountability. And accountability simply just means to hold team members accountable for what we say that we're going to do. We all need accountability. We sincerely do. We need to know that someone's watching and that it matters, that it matters that we're following through with this initiative because change is difficult. And we would need to know that the effort that we're putting into it is worth it. Um, accountability comes best when it's coming from leadership. It can come from other team members, but you have to have a great team. You have to have a really great team that understands good, that everyone has good intentions. And that when they're holding one another accountable, that it is just out of reverence for them and that everybody's just looking to, to meet this initiative. So if the team morale is not where it needs to be, then accountability really needs to come from the leadership. Um, and, and holding someone accountable is really easy. It really is. It, it doesn't have to be confrontational. It could simply be, hey, uh, Susie, here's, here's what we talked about doing. We talked about uh, mentioning to two patients a day that they'd be receiving an email with this online review. And I, I've noticed that that's not happening. Could you tell me about that? And then simply replying with, um, okay, great, Susie, good feedback. What needs to happen now to ensure that you are speaking with two patients a day to tell them about this, the email that they'll be receiving? That's, that's really all it, all it needs to be but it is a very important part of implementing change. So at the beginning of the webinar, I asked you all to think about an area that you were having difficulty with or an initiative that you struggled with implementing in your practice. And now I'd like to uh, open it up and ask a question. Megan, could I have you ask that the poll question and have have our uh, listeners respond? Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, launch this first poll question for everybody. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so I'll give you about 30 seconds just to think about this question and respond. It's uh, multiple choice. If there's a few options to choose from, go ahead and do that. We'll give it about 30 seconds. Um, the question is, which of the following reasons have stalled initiatives in your practice? And Jennifer, are you able to see the responses coming in? I am not. Okay. Give me just a sec here. I'm going to give it a little more time. We still have responses coming in. 
Okay, great. Questions um, or the responses are still coming in, so just maybe 10 more seconds. Hopefully, get everyone response, everyone's response in, and then I will share these with everybody. Excellent, excellent. Perfect. Hold on here one second for me. Okay. All right. So you should be able to see those responses. We had 10 people uh, respond to this. Um, can you see the, the outcomes here now? I cannot, now. Oh, there we go. Share responses. Sorry. Sharing results. Perfect. All right. So we can see that team members not being held accountable uh, was certainly the majority of the responses. And that was followed pretty closely by lack of clarity about the goal or plan to achieve it. I agree that's what I have found as well. And I think sometimes it can be easy to think that the goal and or the plan are, are natural, but really getting down to the details of each, of the goal and of the plan, who's going to do what, when are they going to do it is so important. Um, I hope that that conversation about holding team members uh, accountable was very helpful as well. It does not need to be confrontational. It does not need to be hard. Um, but thank you for responding. Very interesting responses here. But certainly, I think what I've seen throughout uh, practices pretty similar to same response rates. So when we think about the six keys to successful implementation, I hope that by having you bring this back to your practice, and especially with this initiative that you're referring to here in, with the poll, that you can change it, that you can turn it around and make it one of those successful initiatives. And at the very least, know that this skill is something that will make you indispensable to your practice if you can ensure that every initiative is successful. It is absolutely a game changer for your practice. Thanks, Jennifer. We have a few questions that have come in. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer those. Um, but right before, we also have one more poll question um, that I'm going to send out to everybody. Um, this question is, which of the following areas in your practice has implementing change been challenging? And Megan, so I'll give everyone there we go. Uh -huh, yep, about 30 seconds to a minute to answer that. And then we'll get to these questions so you can answer those for everybody, OK? OK, sounds great. All right, I think we have most of our responses now. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, um, and then I'm going to share the results here. Uh, majority of the um, attendees for the webinar said that increasing production is um, where they're struggling to implement change, which I don't, I don't know about you, Jennifer, but um, at Practice Mojo, we hear that often. Um, so one of the things that we do to help with that is basically setting up that recare series, you know, sending your emails and text reminders, getting those patients back in the office, um, setting up one-time blasts um, to make sure those patients are continually coming in, and then helping build online presence to get those new patients, too. Is this something that you hear increasing production is also a challenge when, when you're working with offices? Is that pretty much the majority of I mean, right behind that was building online presence again, which is, you know, getting new patients into the office. Yeah, really, because Megan, all in all, it, you know, our practices are a business. And increasing production, a lot of these other things are what is driving that. And yes, we care about our patients, 
but all in all, we do need to make sure that the business is making money. And there have been changes in, in dental, the dental industry in the last five, 10 years that I think have even increased the need to make sure that our production is increasing at the same rate of, as the expenses of the practice. Perfect. Um, are you able to see some of these questions um, that have come in so we can get these answered for everybody? Let me see if I know. Oh, wait. Oh, yes. Now I can. Yeah. So um, I'll let you go ahead and read these off so so everyone can hear the question if they can't if they can't see it on their screen. Um, I think most of these are for um, your who, what, when, where. They came in pretty sporadically, so I'll go ahead and let you take over. Sure. Okay. So Mallory asks. In reference to getting overdue patients in six months, 12 months, and 18 months, with help of the hygiene, my hygiene are paid on production only. I have a feeling that they will not be thrilled to work and not get paid. How would you go about this? Great question, Mallory. So if your hygienists are paid on production, I think that they should or would be motivated. Um, I can speak from this uh, as I was a hygienist, was working as a hygienist. I know that the more patients that I have in my schedule, the more money and the more hours I'm going to be able to make. And so that certainly would be motivating to me. Um, but when we talk about implementing change, I think certainly first finding out um, what their goals are and how important it is for them to see patients and have a full schedule. And then going about it from that aspect, uh, we know that when presenting ideas to, to other people, whether it be patients or, or whomever, that if we can flip it into what is in it for them, that is helpful. Um, so yeah, I think just just speaking with your hygienist about, okay, look, I know the relationship that you have with your patients. Your patients love you. I also know that in order to keep your schedule full, we need to make sure that we get these patients back in your schedule. Um, I'm confident that the best way to do that would be to have you make these calls. And I think sitting down with them and, and going through, like we talked about on the webinar, if you block their time, and then just pull that block when you are confident that you could fill it with another patient. And so maybe in your practice, you know that you would need at least two weeks to fill an opening in hygiene. Well, then you would want to pull that block two weeks before. Or it might be if you had two days before you could fill that opening in hygiene. Um, the other thing that would be very important to them is what this could do is help them build up the ASAP list. So when they do have a cancellation, failures are a little bit more difficult just because by the time you realize someone's not coming, usually you're about 15 minutes into the appointment. But if your hygienists are making these calls and, and they're scheduling a patient out maybe a couple weeks or a month or two, then they can easily put them on your priority list so that when there is a cancellation a day or two before or whenever, that then they could fill the schedule. Because if they're paid on production, um, I'm confident that they're not gonna be happy about having holes in their schedule, especially when it's in the middle of the day. So I think those would all be uh, good reasons to um, get your hygienist involved and excited about implementing that change. All right, great. Judy asks, what if there is something you feel is an eight to 10, but the leader or the team doesn't, how to get them on board? Ah, good question, Judy. Okay, so if Judy, and, and let's just say that Judy is an office manager, uh, and, and I'm not sure, but, but I'm kind of assuming here by, by this question, or certainly a leader. So if Judy feels that there's something that's very important, but the team doesn't, because I think there's two questions here. If the doctor and Judy are on the same page that this is important, but the team doesn't feel that it's important, how to get them on board would simply be to make sure that they understand the vision of the practice and where the doctor wants to go and why this is important to get there. 
if the doctor, let's see, but the leader or the team doesn't. If the doctor does not feel that it's important, it's going to be challenging. You certainly would need to have buy-in from the owner of the practice before implementing that change. Because what I have seen happen over and over is where one team member feels that the initiative is important, but if the doctor or owner does not, the team will pick up on that. They will pick up on that, and like I said, change, changes can be difficult. It, it, it doesn't have to be difficult, but what it really is most often is changing your habits, right? We all have certain habits that we just do naturally. And so to change make, makes us stop and think instead of being an autopilot. And if the doctor's not completely on board and feeling that it's important, you're, you're going to struggle to get the team to see differently unless that it's something that the team is excited about. So I think it really depends on what the initiative is. Um, if you could give me another example of what you're referring to, I could, I could certainly implement that. But um, the, the doctor and the leader need to be on the same page. They absolutely do. If it's important to the doctor and the leader, you just, just want to get the team, the team on board as well. All right, if great customer, Steve asks, if great customer service is our goal, how do we make that specific? So yes, and it's not enough. Whoops, go ahead. Sorry, Jennifer, I don't want to interrupt you, but we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure we're just being respectful of their time. Um, so we have the, the two questions, if we could get through them um, as quickly as possible, we're still making sure we get those answers for them. Okay, great. Um, with customer service, you can make that specific by using surveys. So um, that's the best way to see how you're doing customer service wise. And how do you approach your doctor to ask them to lead by example? You simply could just go up to the doctor and say, you know, how important is this initiative to you? Hey, I've noticed that you haven't been asking patients for referrals like we talked about. Um, I'm concerned about the team, you know, stopping that as well. Could you tell me about that? What, again, what could we do? What could I do to help you make sure that that happens? Perfect. Um, so I think we've got all the questions answered. Um, I think we have one more slide. If you can move, yep, if you can move over to that slide. Oh, I think I'm controlling it, perfect. Um, so for everyone that attended, we are um, offering, uh, Jennifer has a complimentary 15 minute consultation for anybody. Um, so for example, Judy that had that uh, question where you needed a few more examples could be perfect for her to send an email over and maybe schedule that 15 minute consultation. Uh, for anybody interested in implementing Practice Mojo to take care of some of those changes that you talked about on the polling, uh, internal marketing, we have over 400 campaigns, um, even whitening uh, specials or campaigns to send out to patients, um, online presence, getting reviews for your office, in, increasing production, sending out recare uh, reminders and, and benefit reminders to those patients. We have those available for you. Um, and we're offering two, two weeks free plus 50 additional postcards for your account. And you can email info at practicemojo.com to sign up uh, for a demo or to sign up with Practice Mojo by the 15th to get that special. Um, we also are the only service for automated recall and marketing that includes um, free postcards in your plans, and we don't have any setup fees or um, contracts with Practice Mojo. So, do you have anything else you want to add, uh, Jennifer, before we end this webinar? No, I I think that's great. But I love the fact that there's no contract fees because you're running yeah, for business every every month. I love that. Yeah, yep, definitely. And our our uh, customer support is really amazing. We know that patient satisfaction is pretty much one of the office's primary goals. So we consider support a huge goal of ours to make that easy for you. Answer any questions you have about the service and things like that. 
So we will let everyone go. Thank you from Smart Practice, Practice Mojo, and Virtual Dental Office for joining us. Thank you.